three of these garlic are identical varieties, but all three of them are grown different. And I don't mean different in the sense of the depth or the position. I mean different in the sense of how much water and how much light they received. Because there are some things that are just not up for argument when it comes to growing garlic, some of which is depth and positioning. But I am sure you're gonna learn a thing or two because I did and I was a little bit shocked by some of this. One thing that is not up for debate when it comes to planting garlic is the position that it goes in. So you have something called the base plate, which is kind of that hard bottom part. And then you have the top of the clove. You always wanna make sure that the base is at the base and it is as upright as possible. Now, this has been backed up. University of California did a whole research study on this. The Journal of Applied Horticulture also has published a lot on this and it is not up for debate. Putting it on a slight angle, putting it upside down, because what happens is that storage mechanism has to put a lot more work into figuring out where the sun is. So gravitropism, phototropism, they have their forces, but there has to be energy behind them in order for them to accomplish it. And we don't want that energy spent on growing greens and trying to figure out which way is up. Luckily enough, we're here on planet Earth and we are not growing garlic up in space. So we want to make sure we put them straight up and down. So all of these were planted straight up and down. So next up is actually going to be the planting depth. This is another one that is not up for debate. It doesn't matter so much the inches in which it is planted, one, two, three. What does matter is that it is planted two to three times the depth of your existing clove that you are planting. So if a clove is smaller, it is going to go shallower into the soil. If the clove is larger, it is going to go deeper into the soil. If we plant too shallow, we end up with potential frost damage and a mushy garlic bulb in the spring, or we can end up with frost heaving, which is basically when the frost forces the bulb up out, which will then result in frostbite on your clove. If we go too deep, what happens if we plant all of our cloves at exactly three inches, for example, we end up with garlic that has a lot of gas in the tank and not a lot of gas in the tank. And the ones with not a lot of gas in the tank tend to have smaller total bulbs by the time the growing season is completed if it is planted too deep. And the ones with the jumbo size bulbs, they tend to do okay, but they could do better if they were planted a little bit deeper. Two to three heights of the clove you're looking at in depth in the soil. The bed that performed the worst was actually my bed that received the most sunlight and had the driest conditions. If you did not know this, garlic does enjoy semi arid conditions. It does not like to be heavily wet. And so therefore, in my mind, I thought, well, they love sun because it's garlic and this is less water, so it should be okay. But I ended up with some pretty darn small garlic bulbs out of this area. So the reason for this, I do believe, is because I encountered something called stomatal closure, which I realized was happening long before I went to harvest my bulbs and therefore obviously knew that these were going to be the smallest by a long shot. Now what that is, is when the rates of evapotranspiration are higher than what the plant can restore water back into the plant is. So what happens is our stomata collapse and that is what photosynthesis needs, it's stomata. So once those are gone, we're hoped. After that, all of my turgor pressure disappeared. So now I get a plant that's starting to shrink. And then I had a plant that completely dried out. And that is exactly what happened due to the lack of water combined with that heat. Now the heat this year was not extreme and the drought conditions it was exposed to, in my opinion, also were not extreme because the rest of that bed is doing wonderfully. It looks beautiful. It's happy. It's healthy. So Unfortunately, the plant, while it was forming the 
bulb itself was not able to put much water into the bulb and so it was not able to bulk. So number two, I would say that these ones are kind of like your regular size bulbs. I wouldn't say they're particularly large, but I also wouldn't say they're upsettingly small. I would say they're they're good enough. And these ones were grown in conditions that were part sun, part shade. So it wasn't heavy amounts of sun and it wasn't heavy amounts of shade and they were watered on a regular basis. So I ensured that they received water via being in a self-watering bed. So they had constant access to moisture and this constant access to moisture combined with adequate sunlight means I did not experience that stomatal collapsing that I experienced with the first bed. Instead, I got a plant that was too happy and too healthy. What this meant is I had a lot of foliage and I didn't have a plant that was stressed out enough to think about reproducing and bulking up a bulb in the event that the water source or the gravy train got cut off. Because that plant literally thought it had infinite amounts of resources, it just kind of performed average, which if that's what you're looking for, then that is perfect. So that one, if you want to mimic it, it would be either a self-watering container or raised bed, or you just want to put it in with your regular plants and water them as per normal, that two to three inches a week mark, and everything will be hunky-dory. The last one, this one, I've never done this before. And given, we'll discuss kind of some nuance into this, here in a little bit, but the biggest bulbs by a lot, and probably some of the biggest garlic I've ever grown, is in the front. And it was again, part sun, part shade. I would say it probably got a little bit more shade than bed number two. And it also was in a position that I allowed it to kind of just get watered ambiently. Now here's the thing. This year was incredibly rainy, so it was receiving, I would say, exactly one to three inches on the high end throughout the entire summer, every single week. And I had it in a position where I actually was hoping to expose it to even more drought conditions because I wanted my runner beans to actually run up, but it was too cold this year to allow for that to happen. But regardless, it was pulled away from water, so it was water starved. However, it was not in full sun, but also wasn't in full shade. Now what happened here, I think it got an adequate amount of light, which allowed it to bulk up both leaf and bulb wise. And then I think the stress of lack of water actually is what caused that bulk formation on the actual bulb itself. So garlic, if you did not know, is technically a cold season crop. So yes, it likes light and it likes heat, but it also is meant for our zone. So if you are forcing it into an environment that is really hot or really cool, it's not going to do well. So if you give it a little bit of both, it tends to perform pretty pretty good. And so because of the fact that I didn't put it in a very stressful position, that bulb did what nature intended that bulb to do. Now you combo that with the fact that garlic, if you did not know, is actually a drought tolerant plant, meaning it does better in an environment where it doesn't get a ton of water. It it does best in an environment where it is semi-drought-ish. And that means that that self-watering bed garlic, if I wouldn't have had it in that bed, it would have been just fine outside of that because it was in very similar light conditions. So the reason why the self-watering bed probably got to the size it did solely had to do with the fact that it got adequate levels of sunlight. And the temperature obviously was cohesive towards growth. Okay, so if I was going to mimic this and I didn't know what your guard looked like, here's the recommendations I would give you. I would recommend you to not play around with planting position or depth. It is a known fact. What I said at the beginning of the video is how it is done. There's no interpretation there whatsoever. Number two is actually allowing the bed that that garlic is in to have a dry down period. So yes, that plant needs moisture. It is drought tolerant, not resistant. And so we want to ensure it gets some water. If we can put garlic kind of on its own and then water it as needed, then it's probably going to perform 
best. The next thing to look at is the actual lighting it's exposed to. So full sun was too much sun. Part shade seemed to be the key here. So in the event that you don't have a part shade garden, so to put it in perspective, it got around, it got around six hours of direct light, about two to three hours of indirect light and then the remainder obviously was dark or and or covered in shade and so in order to mimic this in your garden if you don't have trees like I do it would be shade cloth so this can come in the form of either a low tunnel with where you just have kind of a linen over top or it can come in the form of like some sort of structure you don't have to get too fancy with it you just want to kind of cut the heat and cut the sun in that mid-afternoon range that is going to prevent that stomatal collapse. It's going to help even out water uptake and loss and all that sort of stuff. And it'll work out pretty nicely. The next one is actually mulch. Now this is something that all my plants were exposed to because I do mulch everything. So the ones in the sunny spot were mulched. The ones in the regular kind of teepee area were also mulched. The self-watering bed was also mulched. It doesn't look like it was mulched because it's self-watering. So it's all kind of really soaking wet, to be totally honest. So it didn't look like there was mulch, but there's mulch there. And the only difference in soil type would be that the raised bed is actually like a peat coconut compost mix with perlite. And then the other two beds are identical soil. Actually, I bought them at the same time. So one factor that could have played in here was the amount of pressure on that bulb. So the one that was in the sunny, dry space was really close. It was, it's a raised bed, but it's really not a raised bed. So I would argue because of that, it's very likely that there's a substantial, there's more compaction there, maybe not substantial, but there's more compaction in that area. It also is like underneath the eaves troughs. Like I said, this year has been wild for weather, tornadoes, hail, torrential downpours, and torrential downpours sometimes meant that the eaves literally couldn't take any more water. And so the water came off the eaves and it smashed down onto that soil. And if you didn't know, water is a huge compactor of soil. So that could have played into the whole full sun, completely dry scenario. The other one was in ground as well. It's truly not raised at all. It is a no dig. So it literally was cardboard with soil. I don't do compost. I just did soil on top with mulch. And so that space, um, because it's not like, there's not foot traffic there, obviously there's no brick. And then also didn't have the rain compaction. Could that have played a factor a small factor, yes, it is possible. This is the beauty of plant and soil science. You can literally run year after year and get completely different results for an entire decade. And that's where there's some nuance in a lot of these studies that we need to take into consideration because we can't control mother nature and what she decides to do. It is completely up to her. We just get to roll with it. So mitigating factors is what we like to call this. And so that one possible, it could have helped. Now, I don't, know if it's that big of a deal because then if you look at the raised bed kind of really loose fluffy stuff it performed pretty good and i don't think it performed stellar unless of course maybe the water was cut off a little bit more maybe then that looser kind of container or that looser bed would have allowed for a larger garlic is really hard to say but regardless of that geek crew you had to let me know in the comments down below have you ever grown hard neck garlic do you love it do you hate it what varieties are you growing i like music i think i've said this a million times but music and red russian are like my two faves elephant garlic expensive but if you're willing to put garlic in the correct conditions could be worth your time and the only reason for that is because there's less peeling so when you actually go to use the garlic the one single little clove is ginormous, so you probably are going to use the whole bulb still because it's garlic and it's delicious, but you don't have to peel as much, which is kind of nice. Anyways, Geek Crew, I will talk to you guys next time.